Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord has been out for a full year now, and a lot has changed since version 1.0. We've gotten an improvement to performance and stability, and the graphics improved around version 1.2 or version 1.3. We now have sandbox kingdoms, brand new perk and experience systems, a succession system for existing kingdoms, and a number of other improvements that were once just simply mods to the game that the developer decided to add as official parts of the game. With all that being said, there is still really so much that needs to happen, and with a proposed release date of Q4 2021, those improvements can't come soon enough. We already know we're getting some system change-ups and the addition of a context battle system, giving us battle maps that reflect the campaign map. But in this video today, I want to go through my picks for the top 10 things that need to be changed in Bannerlord. I provided the list in the description and timeline if you'd like to just skip ahead to the parts that interest you the most. Also, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, if you can, hit that little bell icon. I know it's annoying to hear, but with the most recent algorithm shift, it would help a ton. Lastly, you can always pick up Bannerlord or any game I cover through my Nexus store link in the description, which will net you a direct Steam key, and it's a great way to support the channel. But let's discuss the top 10 changes Bannerlord needs. Number 10 and our first subject is an expansion upon the multiplayer system of the game. This one is a bit unfair as it has yet to really be fully fleshed out, but when early access first came out, the multiplayer scene was thriving. I would play countless hours of captain mode with friends as, they were, as there were uh, plenty of people queuing up for battles across all the major servers. If you haven't yet checked out multiplayer, I promise that it is extremely fun if you're lucky enough to both get the multiplayer client to launch and actually make it into a game. Terra Worlds has done at least a good job of keeping multiplayer interesting by adding maps, balance changes, additional UI fixes, the new clan system, stability improvements, pike bracing, which I mean you can't even do in single player yet, and some other fun features. But with the community split between main and beta branches constantly, it's hard for any consistent gameplay to be established in multiplayer. The biggest improvement would also be the launch of private servers. These were a staple of the war ban experience and unfortunately until we get closer to or upon full release we probably won't experience this anytime soon still it's something terror worlds will need to hash out as a strong multiplayer scene along with the good modding community can keep a game alive far beyond launch which brings me to my next point bannerlord is in dire need of solid steam workshop integration there are some absolutely incredible mods out there amongst the community across both mod db and nexus but it has become very exhausting keeping up with a modding framework that is constantly changing and, as thus, mods that are confusing to keep updated. Never mind me, the end user, playing a mod and trying to guess which mod to use. Imagine being a modder and trying to keep up with constant hotfixes that break your mods, main and beta branches that make developing your mod a lot of working over yourself, and a number of other struggles. We only just recently were granted access to modding tools back in late 2020, so at least we're moving in a positive direction with mods. And each new beta branch brings more modding patch notes that I don't overly understand Understand, but I'm sure modders do. With a solid Steam Workshop integration, mods can be updated seamlessly for the end user and there's a solid, reliable platform for maximum exposure for growing mod teams such as the crew over at Betwalda, the Old World, Eagle Rising, or any other amazing mod that are, or any of the other amazing mods that are in production for Bannerlord. Make sure you check out my video on the Old World we just put up linked in the upper right corner if you want to see what the Old World looks like. It's Warhammer in Bannerlord and it's awesome. But the biggest thing that integration will help with is launching and troubleshooting these mods. Currently, you have to use either Vortex Mod Manager or manually install and uninstall mods. This can be a bit user unfriendly and even for tech savvy people mods might just break for no reason but now that we've talked about two feature features that are outside of the main game let's dive in on some core mechanic overhauls that bannerlord sorely needs number eight is all about roguery and to be fair we've recently had a good amount of expansion upon this feature in the most recent patches roguery as a skill tree has been fully fleshed out with new perks a ton of better more reliable ways to get experience selling prisoners raiding caravans raiding villages pillaging villages breaking into sieges and breaking prisoners out of prison are just some of the ways to gain roguery experience 
The expansion to raiding villages where you can pillage or devastate them was a nice addition. But what I'd really like to see is a full expansion upon roguery gameplay. You can attack the gang leaders in cities, netting a quick little mini quest where you fight them in a kind of king of the hill type battle, but that's about where that ends. In some of the earlier developer blogs, there had been discussion about becoming your own gang leader. I love the ability to be this, you know, bandit king, allying with the bandits and looters of the land, maybe, or making it so that you can have your own hideout and, and starting a mini war against a specific kingdom, you know, wh whatever it is. Something that is a bit more diverse than simply attacking caravans and raiding villages. Even looking at the roguery tree up to version 1.5.3, it was aimed at recruiting bandits so maybe that all plays into a proposed playstyle for them. I'd also love to see a roguery skill that affects sieges, maybe creating an inside man, as it were, that perhaps destroys a siege engine on the other side, something that can make for some sabotage. There are so many possibilities in roguery, and I feel like it's just a little too narrow right now. Being a truly nefarious character that lives outside of the normal constraints of the game as sort of a much harder but highly rewarding experience is something that I think a lot of players have been after for a long time with the roguery skill line. Number seven is our city management system, and owning your own city is one of the big goals of Bannerlord, but as it stands right now, it's a bit of a hollow experience, and the city management system could use a lot of love. In one of the more recent patches, the ability for cities to rebel has become a part of the game, making it so that you have to really monitor the happiness and security of the cities you directly control. This has been a much needed improvement as there were no quote unquote stakes to owning a city if it dropped low in any of its stats, outside of it costing you money that is. Right now you can simply assign a governor, construct buildings, and let the city grow or decline from there. But I think this could be so much more interesting and even without getting crazy about it. There are plenty of people that play Bannerlord as traders or other role players where they focus less on being a general and more on the civic portions of the game. What I'd love to see is the ability to assign your main character as the governor of a city. From there, you would assign a companion to take over your party. Then, you could effectively play on the campaign map as that companion while your main character governs the city. Let's take it a bit further though. Tail Worlds could create periodic events that occur in the city, much like the dilemma system of Total War or Crusader Kings, where you, the governor, are pitted with a quote-unquote situation you have to decide upon. This could be a pop-up on the right, much like the child tutor system where it says it demands your immediate attention. From there, you jump into a mini conversation with whatever the predicament is, giving you options to answer or sway the situation based on your skills, your character traits, or such as honor and what have you, or even just role-playing as a specific type of ruler, whatever it is. This would result in set bonuses and set penalties for the city, like maybe more garrison production at the cost of happiness or increased food consumption, just whatever it is. This would really create the air that your character has become the ruler of a kingdom versus just a marauding general. The character could then lead the defense in the event of a siege, rebellion, or maybe a prison break from the AI that you have to defend against. There are a lot of really fun ways you could expand on city management while also giving your character a more active chance to use steward, charm, and trade skills, as well as any perks tagged with governor on the perk screen. For our sixth entry, we're talking about unit overhauls. Now, I have an entire video on this linked in the upper right, but there needs to really be a lot of love poured into the troop tree. I've had the lovely privilege to talk to the individual at Tail Worlds in charge of this matter, and he told me the reasoning behind a lot of the gripes I brought up in my video. He also said I changed his mind on some things. So when you see the Sturgeon Archer line all using axes in version 1.5.10, you now know why. One of the biggest things we proposed in that video though was an entire overhaul to the Batanian unit roster. They always get snuffed out in the grand campaign slapped between two much stronger factions to their east and west with very limited chances to access their noble units. Speaking of noble units, the Sturgian noble unit takes so long to really come online that it results in Sturgia getting crushed by either Volandia or Kazate, not to mention what just happened to them in version 1.5.10. 
Now, that's not the only reason there are a number of issues with the AI trying to navigate such a huge swath of land to fight wars on multiple fronts, you know, something that happens quite a bit for Sturgia in their campaign. But until Asurai, Sturgia, and Batania can get a true and proper strengthening of their unit tree with clear-cut strengths and weaknesses, Blondia, the Empire, and Kazate will always reign supreme. This can become a little tiresome as nearly every campaign is dominated by one, if not all three of those kingdoms very quickly. The biggest point of an overhaul would be to make each kingdom feel truly unique in the way it approaches warfare, rather than similar rosters with slight deviations. I understand that you have to have balance, but even outside of the roster, the way that the AI accesses the weapons and skills it has at its disposal also needs to be looked at, because some units are crippled just by the virtue of, say, a throwing weapon using the polearm skill to calculate damage or vice versa. So with the unit system needing a refresh, there's another one that is sorely in need of a pass as well. Bringing us to number five, a crafting system rework. Now to be fair here as well, we have recently gotten some changes to the way stamina regenerates and some quality of life to smithing here and there. And Tail Worlds has said that they will be changing the entire crafting system. The problem here is that that was almost three or four full dev diaries ago, and we still have yet to see anything regarding a refreshed crafting system. This is probably going to be one of the harder systems to rework, as it will probably be rebuilt from the ground up, much like the new skill and experience system was many patches ago. This is a subject that we've covered before, you guessed it, linked in the upper right, and there are just so many pitfalls in the system. For one, there are crafting parts that are just fundamentally broken, providing a ludicrous amount of money to the player if sold, breaking weapon stats outside of their normal constraints for the weapon type, or any number of wonky existing mechanics. Also, on the notion of money, the crafting system promotes the abuse of smelting down items and crafting ludicrous pole arms to sell and bankrupt an entire town with one item. These items are then recycled around the map and in the arena at rewards, further destroying the economy of your save game. It used to be you'd smelt and sell the raw components, which was still netting a ton of money, but at least these raw materials would provide a means for ironmongers and other workshops to produce their byproducts. In addition to just crafting weapons, the ability to craft armor, shields, bows, and maybe even barding is a feature that has greatly been requested by the community. Having smithing as a catch-all for simply weapon craft, a weapon crafting system seems like a watered-down approach to what in otherwise would be a much deeper system. Perhaps the existing system is a placeholder in lieu of a much more diverse one coming, but the added ability to craft more of the game's many wearable items is a much needed change. Check out my video for the deeper dive I did on the subject, but I think this one, this is one that we will hopefully get soon as it's been quite some time since Terra Worlds has said anything about it. Our fourth entry, Armor Diversity, is linked to number five and a bit of a quicker item in this list. Tower Worlds has added a significant amount of Batanian and Sturgian armors since the game's early access launch back in 2020, but there are still such a stupid high amount of helmets in the game that it almost drowns out any kind of shoulder or chest piece diversity. In addition, there's a fraction of glove and boot alternatives as well. One of the most recent patches just added a variations to the shoulder pieces, which is nice, but still not overly amazing. We did just get some new helmets and some new boots too in version 1.5.10. If we could craft custom armor based off of set assets like a chest piece where we decide if it's chain, scale, or brigandine, le lamellar, or what have you, then cycle through different options for each one, it would be amazing. But just simply the ability to have more options within each tier would be such a huge step up. I feel like almost all my characters follow a set path of armor specific to the culture I'm going after. Even moreover, all the NPCs typically have the exact same armor on, and it's usually one or two tier six armor pieces appropriate to that kingdom's culture. It's worth mentioning though, that this isn't something I expect Terra Worlds to really put a ton of effort into, as there are already a ton of amazing armor mods out there. Colorado Reborn the Armory, Swadian Armory, Vagir Armory, the list goes on and on. Just simply look at the amazing armor models for the Eagle Rising mod, but still, 
A little more variety in the base game, similar to the treatment Batania and Sturgia got, would go a long way to feel like there's more options in other cultures. Number three is also linked to another dev diary from Tale Worlds. And proper sieges are something that the game is not necessarily lacking because you can still have a really cool, awesome siege in your gameplay. But that's not always the case. And depending on the map, you might get a really buggy path for the AI that re just results in them clumping in one region to get killed in droves. Version 1.5.10 that just released did help with some of those nav mesh bottlenecks, but it's not a perfect system just yet. There have been a number of improvements to Siege AI though, especially how they interact with Siege equipment, mounting ladders from Siege Towers, using battering rams, and manning the various Siege engines. Also, Tail Worlds teased keep battles just recently, so that might be a part of the newest patch or two. But before we can even talk about the actual siege itself though, there are so many issues on the campaign map before the siege can even begin. For one, having an engineer in your party, not you yourself being the engineer, or in your army, just does nothing for you where it would otherwise significantly help with creating siege equipment, special attributes like flaming ammunition, or helping in reducing siege setup time. Second, the AI is terrible at running sieges. A few patches back, Terror Worlds had changed a calculation that would occur for the defenders of a siege to calculate the surrounding allied forces to see if they could sally out and attack the besiegers on open ground. This worked for all of one patch, and now the defending AI parties won't attack the besiegers. So this results in your kingdom losing a castle they otherwise would have been able to sally out with their allies and keep. Truth be told though, this was also heavily tooled in version 1.5.10 and requires some testing to see how well it has been fixed. Now, in the actual siege map, the AI gets too bogged down, and it's too random what units spawn into a siege battle. There seems to be no priority or rhyme or reason to what comes in onto the battlefield. If sieges had a similar menu to assaulting a hideout, where you get to choose perhaps waves or how things zone in, it would be huge. I don't want my cavalry force, which is still great in combat, to all zone in on foot and get killed while it's my infantry's job to do the actual sieging. Further, if you're the assaulting force, you can barely place any troops anywhere in what is supposed to be your deployment zone. On the other side of that coin, the defender also has equally as wonky placement options, where some units will stay at points in the wall that actually hinder the defense. Overall, sieges need a lot of work. Again, though, don't get me wrong, they're still a fun experience, but they can be made into an incredible experience with some AI pathing fixing, campaign map tweaks, and depth added with keep battles. Number two is all about workshops, and I think they have been in a really weird place for the entirety of early access. The overall objective of a workshop is to produce passive income that you can rely on, but that hasn't really been the case, has it? Mainly because of the randomness of workshops from patch to patch. As of the posting of this video, the strongest workshops are wool weaveries in any of the cities of the Kazate. Pottery used to be the flavor of the month. Originally it was lumber, it just really depended on the patch really. Also, figuring out which workshop to produce in a city is not necessarily a straightforward uh, approach. The simple math behind it is that each workshop takes a specific amount of raw material to make a corresponding output. For example, and this is from the mouth of Mighty Developer Mexico himself, a brewery converts eight grain into eight beer every day. So if you look at the cost of grain and the price of beer in a city, then you get the rough estimate of what you can make per unit per day in that city. A further example would be grain trading at five and beer trading at 40 will result in a net profit of 35. Times that by eight and you have the income of a brewery in said city, which is 280. In my case, it's Donestica for 220. Now there's no way to really know that unless you watch every little trade good per day or look into the code. More transparency with the workshops would be ideal. Workshops themselves seem unfinished because we look at the workshops in the clan screen and we can see all these numbers, namely the workshop level, that don't really correspond to much of anything. This has me hopeful for a large rework to workshops on the horizon as the developers have teased some possible changes to them coming in version 1.6. Whatever it is, I think that making workshops become a dependable form of passive income is crucial, especially for newer players who maybe have zero idea of how workshops have developed over the year.
Perhaps even adding icons next to all the villages on the map so you can easily see where the trade goods are, then having connecting lines when a city is selected to see where they pull their resources from would help in determining what kind and where to make your workshops across Colradia. Here we are, the first place spot and one of the aspects of the game I think needs the biggest overhaul before we make it to launch. The starting portions or early game of Bannerlord is just very weak unless playing a very specific role play for your character. Now, uh, we did just get some brand new intro cinematics for the campaign that does set up the campaign and give you some context. But the campaign being quite shallow and lacking any motivating factor outside of getting it cleared out of your quest log is a huge part of this because even if there were more smaller campaign quests that introduce you to more mechanics in a fun, entertaining way, it would make the initial stages of the game a bit more fleshed out. But as it stands, any character I create, I pretty much run around the map, recruiting units, killing small looter bands, doing the odd hideout here and there, and mainly doing tournaments. For the first handful of hours, this is actually a very entertaining gameplay loop, but there's so much more that could be added in here. Don't get me wrong, there are quests that you can do, like Family Feud, Caravan Escort, etc., but Almost all of them are cumbersome and hardly worth the value for time invested. Take in and out. You can get that done by just paying it away and it nets you a ton of money. This was just recently patched though in version 1.510 and it's now capped at 800. The laborer's quest where you turn in bandits also nets you a heap of money as well. Transforming trade goods for any of the Asarai villages with horses will get you so much early money you won't want to do with it. But all of these feel more gamey and exploits rather than building the narrative of my character. Perhaps if there was a way to actually escort and protect an NPC as he travels from one village to the city, giving a chance for encounters along the way like the caravan quest, but on a shorter scale and boosting relation with someone who can actually give you better recruitable units would be huge. There could even be a chance encounter in the destination city that results in a street fight. An internal beta tester had told me that there are hidden quest lines from each head of a kingdom that are supposed to lead to elaborate quest chains. Where are those? Perhaps we can have a quest where, you simp where you're simply a town guard, giving you a chance to maybe earn some cheap gear and get involved in more city-based encounters, something that is you know, sorely missed. Or even quests around crafting where you aid the town smithy by crafting items. I just love a lot more options in the early game that are tethered to the multiple ways you can interact with the game world. I know there are a few fun ones here and there, but most seem mainly passive or geared solely to giving you an unfair, an unfair financial advantage. Perhaps an actual tournament system that progresses where you fight harder and harder opponents, or perhaps a yearly grand finals where the top 10 people on the leaderboard are invited to fight at one location. That, that exists, by the way, if you didn't know. You can climb the leaderboard in the game the more that you win, and it's why you make less money from betting because you're already favored to win. More situations, though, where your character can actually lean into a growing game ecosystem rather than simply doing some abstract sideline quest. These are the things that make your game experience feel alive versus 15 of the same quests carbon copied around the map. Lastly, I'd love to see versions of our characters across the map, different versions of our characters. What I mean by that is some other AI-controlled minor clan that's starting out on its own, just like you are. One individual growing the clan from the ground up. These could act as targets for alliances later in the game or early aggression to sharpen your skills. There are a set amount of minor clans that are already well established, but give me more smaller minor nobles to interact with. Make the world feel truly different with each playthrough. And at that, it brings our video here to a close. Now, let me reiterate here. Over the last year, Tale Worlds has added a ton to Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord. They have really tweaked a lot of systems that were broken, and they have done a great job of listening to the community to help bolster the game in a way that the community wants, maybe not so much in the way that Bannerlord had intended to grow with its original roadmap. So there is definitely a much-needed congratulations and hats off to those 
over at Tail Worlds who have been constantly developing over the year to make a game that has grown in a lot of very different ways. This list is not necessarily meant to be an overly negative list because a lot of these things are already being worked on, but there can just be so much more pulled out of the system. And this is mainly meant for a way for us, the community, to communicate with the developers to say, hey, we want even more in these locations. So if you do have stuff that you'd like to see added to the game, please let it be known on the forums, on Reddit, in the comments section. I know that Tail Worlds reads these and they take it all to heart. So as always, guys, thank you very much for watching here today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, comment below, all that fun action. But as always, have a good one and take care.